It is Wednesday, December 7th, 2022, and we're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We'll be in Genesis chapter 27 tonight, so you may want to be turning with me there so you can have a Bible open in your own lap or on a desk or the table or wherever you are tonight. We're glad that you found us, and we're looking forward to studying this chapter in just a few moments. Genesis chapter 27, and we also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. We're getting back to our brand new study of the book of Ephesians. And then we also hope you can stick around for worship. The worship assembly starts at 1030 and we're usually there for about an hour and you would be our honored guest. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send me an email at fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would certainly love to hear from you. In terms of our calendar, this coming Sunday we're looking forward to doing some bowling together right after worship on Sunday, December 11th. Uh, Dream Lanes is pretty much behind the fire station on Cottage Grove Road, kind of kitty corner northeast of Culver's. And they've got a pizza pit, I believe, in the bowling alley. So bring a friend to worship this Sunday. Plan on doing some bowling. Even if you do not like bowling, it is still good to be around God's people. So uh, join us for that. Even if you sit at a table and eat a piece of pizza or whatever you want to do, we'd love to have you with us so we can get to know each other better. And uh, especially since uh, things seem to be going better. If you have any questions, get in touch with Gary or Sarah Mueller. They'd be glad to answer all of your questions about bowling and lunch this coming Lord's Day. Tonight we are back to the book of Genesis, so the book of beginnings written by Moses, and we are now focusing in on the life of Isaac. So we've had some major Bible characters. Of course, we started with Adam and Eve, we had Noah, and then we quickly moved along to Abraham. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, kind of the patriarchs of Israel. And uh, last week we looked at Isaac heading into the land of the Philistines due to a famine in the land. And just like his father Abraham had done, Isaac also deceives the local king into thinking that his wife Rebekah is actually his sister. Well, the king discovers the truth. He issues a warning that no one is to touch either Isaac or Rebekah under penalty of death. And because of this, just because God is blessing him, Isaac's flocks multiply a hundredfold. And then you may remember last week in the chapter we looked at, chapter 26, the locals start filling in a series of wells that were originally dug by Abraham. And Isaac's people redig those wells as they back away from that area, working their way back into the land of Canaan. And eventually the king of the Philistines basically chases him down and asks for a peace treaty, seeing that Isaac is becoming more and more wealthy and more powerful. And if you remember, Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau, with Esau being the firstborn. But in a moment of weakness, Esau sells his birthright. He sells the right of having been born first to his younger brother. And he's hungry after a day of hunting. He comes in and he trades that birthright for a bowl of stew. And so he was apparently quite impulsive, not very wise in making a decision like that uh, on the spur of the moment. So that brings us to Genesis chapter 27 as we kind of deal with the aftermath of that decision. So our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 27 verses 1 through 4. Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 4. Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he said to him, Here I am. Isaac said, Behold now, I am old and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Well, tonight we're introduced to the ancient custom of a father blessing his sons. And I believe this might be the first reference to this in Scripture. I don't remember seeing this with Adam or Noah or even Abraham, if I remember correctly. Uh, but we have it here with Isaac. And so his goal is to bless his son. And in a sense, this is a little bit strange to me, especially as it unfolds here in Genesis 27. But uh, the idea seems to be that a father conveys his wishes uh, to his children. But in this case, it almost seems like more than a wish, doesn't it? it these are almost on the level of prophecy. Uh, but not just prophecy in the sense of predicting what happens, but it's almost as if the blessing causes something to happen. 
And I think you'll agree, it's kind of an unusual situation that we have here and with some of the other blessings that happen in the book of Genesis. But that's kind of the weird part to me. It's, it's We're not familiar with this in our culture today. Um, and before we get into this, I would just tie this in to something that has become more popular over the past several decades, and I believe for, for good reason, and that is the practice of creating an ethical will. An ethical will. And I bring it up here because it's somewhat tied to the biblical concept of parents on their deathbeds giving these blessings to their children. I'm pretty sure most of us in class tonight know what a will is. This past Sunday at Culver's, uh, I was sitting there with a group from church, and I kind of half-jokingly said uh, that my will is that when I die, my binder clips of uh, free custard tokens from my car would be distributed to everybody at my funeral so that everybody can go to Culver's after the funeral and have a scoop of Flavor of the Day on me. Well, as some of you know, the Culver's on Cottage Grove Road opened the same week that we started meeting as a church on Acewood Boulevard, and we have purchased literally hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, kids' meals at that location. And, um, and you know, if you purchase a kids' meal, you know it comes with a Scoopy token like uh, that you can add up toward a prize. If you get 10 of those, by the way, you get a free kids meal so that's kind of the best way i've been using them Um, but it also comes with a a little slip of paper a token i think it used to be an actual like a wooden nickel they would give you but now it's on the bag uh, for a free scoop a flavor of the day so the kid they would eat their meal and they would save that token they could bring it to the counter and then they get their free scoop for dessert well in our family a lot of times we would go there with church and by the time we were done with uh, the meal it was kind of time to get out of there it was kind of getting late And maybe we weren't hungry, so we didn't eat the free scoop, and so those kind of tended to collect in my glove box. And finally, uh, years ago, I just got a great big old binder clip and uh, kind of been storing those. I don't know, I've got maybe a hundred of those right now uh, in the glove box of my car. If my car is broken into the next few days, I'm going to know it's one of you who are uh, watching tonight. Uh, But anyway, my will is that those be distributed upon my death. You know, that may be the most valuable thing that I own, a glove box full of Scoopy tokens. But I think we understand that a will it distributes physical assets. So, you know, being of sound mind and spirit, I hereby will that my son get this, my daughter get this, that my assets be split 50-50, or, you know, any number of things can be said in a will. So money, houses, all kinds of stuff are physical possessions. Well, an ethical will, though, is a document where we communicate our spiritual will for our children, our moral, our ethical instructions. And I learned about this while doing some graduate level research down at a Grace Hospice Care in Fitchburg and uh, attended a lot of meetings, did a lot of learning during that semester, observing all kinds of uh, situations there at the Grace, a great, great organization, a good work that they're doing. And uh, one of those lessons was that an ethical will can help bring peace to those who are dying. And it's a way to tie up some loose ends. It's a way to communicate life lessons to our children. This is what is important to me. I hope that it is to you as well. That kind of message is passed along in an ethical will. I have an ethical will from my great-grandfather, Fred Elijah Exum. I also have one from my own father. And uh, I will treasure that document more than the... Uh, last will and testament because uh, certainly the spiritual legacy passed down is far more important than any physical assets that may be passed along from one generation to the next. Uh, But I would uh, highly recommend looking into this. If you do a quick Google search for ethical will, you'll find all kinds of examples and ideas and guides and some uh, information on how to do this in your own life. But anyway, I just bring this up now because this is one of the early examples of it in Scripture, right here in Genesis 27, the concept of a father blessing his children, you know, passing along a blessing or a curse or a life lesson or, you know, this is what's important to me, I hope it is to you, and and that. And we see it here, we'll also see it several times throughout Scripture. Well, here, as he seems to see the end of his life coming, um, and, and that's really, he doesn't know when he's going to die. I, I believe if we add it up, he lives for a number of uh, more decades. So he's not really at the end, but maybe he thinks he is. Maybe his health is uh, taking a nosedive here for some reason or another. But anyway, as he thinks his life may be ending, uh, Isaac calls for Esau, his oldest son, and he has him go out hunting. He wants him to bring him some wild game. Uh, This is something that Esau really enjoyed. It's almost like he's uh, choosing his last meal. 
Uh, my wife knows if I have a choice, it would be fried chicken. It's a major pain to prepare, a lot of big mess, you know, it's not, it's hard. Uh, but that man, if, if somebody says, what do you want for dinner tonight? Um, homemade fried chicken, that'll do it. Well, this is kind of um, Isaac's version of fried chicken. This is what he wanted. You know, this is, uh, this is my excuse for this last meal. And the goal is he wants to use this occasion uh, to bless his son Isaac before he dies. So let's continue then with Genesis 27, verses 5 through 17. Genesis 27, verses 5 through 17. Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke this to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a savory dish for me that I may eat, and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there, that I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me. Then I will be as a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. She also gave the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. So the plot thickens, doesn't it? It's kind of getting getting intense here. In verse 5, we find Rebecca was eavesdropping on the conversation. I don't think this is the first or the last time this is going to happen. And so she's listening in on this. And uh, now we really start to see some dysfunction in this family. And I've said before, if you want to see some dysfunctional families in the Bible, if you want to see some huge family messes and some huge family fights and just some awful things happening between loved ones, start with Genesis. I mean, the book of beginnings, this is one of the worst. And I say this because, I mean, we just saw an awful case of favoritism in this family with the father, Isaac, favoring his firstborn son, Esau, the mother, Rebecca, favoring the younger of the sons, Jacob. And so there's favoritism within the family. That right there is a big deal. We could spend all night just talking about that. And because of this favoritism, it leads to other issues, doesn't it? So we've got Rebecca now conspiring with her son Jacob to trick her own husband into blessing the wrong son first. So we have rivalry between siblings coming up here. We, we've got this issue between a married couple. We have their favoritism of one child over the other. All kinds of, it's just a huge messed up family situation. And it is an elaborate plan, isn't it? There's a lot, there are a lot of moving pieces to this. Rebecca wants Jacob to go get a goat from the herd instead of hunting. So time is of the essence. You know, the older son has already left. He's, he's out there hunting. He's going to come home and he's going to cook it. And he's going to bring it to dad. So you need to beat him. And so you need to just go get a goat from out back, you know, go in the fence, kill one, bring it back, and she'll prepare it as if it were wild game. And she wants Jacob to pretend to be Esau. So, you know, Jacob hears this plan, and what was his concern with this plan? Well, as he thinks through what might happen here, as he's kind of running through the uh, potential issues, uh, he realizes his father will most likely recognize him, mainly due to the fact that his brother is hairy, and he is not. And then he'll get not a blessing, but he'll get a curse, and he'll end up worse than it would have been otherwise. So, Rebecca, though... Uh, don't worry, blame me. I'll, I'll take any curse that happens. Kind of reminds me of the people in Acts chapter 2, you know, like the curse be on us and on our children. And then, you know, the, the, the blessing would in Acts 2 go on from generation to generation as well. Um, but anyway, the, the curse would end up uh, being worse for him than it would have been otherwise. So Rebecca takes this then to the next level, pretty much ordering Jacob to do that. And I find that interesting. I'm thinking he's kind of a, a grown man here. I don't think we have his exact age at this point. Uh, but she orders her son to do this, and he obeys his mother. 
So that's kind of another issue in this dysfunctional family here. And uh, she prepares the meal. She dresses Jacob. So she's dressing her son. She's dressing Jacob in Esau's clothing. And she takes the skin of the goats, puts it on Jacob's hands and on the back of his neck to kind of further fool Isaac into thinking that Jacob is actually Esau. So now there are multiple levels to this deception. It's not just a quick and simple thing, but there are a lot of moving parts to this. It is a rather complex plan. Well, obviously, we step back, we will, we look at this, and we kind of wonder, well, well, why didn't these people just talk it out? Why didn't they just have a family meeting, just a conversation like maybe normal people might do? You know, we've got a father and a mother married to each other. We've got two grown sons, and it, it seems like surely they would have been able to work something out here. Um, but apparently not. And I think we look at some of our own situations in our families today, and, and we think, okay, I can kind of understand maybe how this might have gone down the way that it did. So just a messed up family situation. They resort to this deception, and that's how this thing gets started. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 27, verses 18 through 23. Genesis 27, 18 through 23. Then he, that is Jacob, came to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please, sit and eat of my game that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have so that you have it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come close, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob came close to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Well, the first new information I think we have in this passage is that uh, this, this isn't just deception. But at this point, Jacob just outright lies to his own father, doesn't he? So it's not just a little bit of pretending here and there. This is outright lying from a son to his father. And starting here, as well as throughout this chapter, it really seems like Isaac suspects something, doesn't he? He's old, but he's not stupid. He, something is going on here, and, and something is wrong. Something is off. And, and Jacob addresses Isaac as father, uh, and Jacob wants to know, who are you, my son? And right there, that, that does not seem normal, to me at least. It, you know, it's a strange question. And, um, and, and to me, it seems maybe Isaac is suspicious, even from the very beginning here. And, and Jacob goes all in. I am Esau, your firstborn. So that's now the second lie, I think. I have done as you told me. There's the third lie. Uh, get up, please, sit and eat of my game. That's a fourth lie. It wasn't his game. It, it was, wasn't game at all. That you may bless me. So all these things together, it's just one lie or deception after the other. And in verse 20, Isaac, once again, seems to be a bit suspicious. Again, something is not quite right here. It should have taken Esau longer to hunt and kill and prepare the wild game and, and that. And notice Jacob's response. He attributes his speed to God. The Lord your God caused it to happen to me. And so this is at least the fifth lie, if not more, as Jacob blames this on the Lord. And uh, it may or may not be significant here, but we should also notice how Jacob speaks to his father and refers to your God. So God is not his God. It's not Jacob's God. This is your God. You know, Dad, this is your God. Help me with this hunt. And uh, this is his, his father's God. This isn't really personal for Jacob at this point. So he's, he's a bit of a, of a deceiver. He seems to be something uh, like kind of distant from God. A little bit of word of warning here. A lot of times people are very quick to attribute things to God when we really don't know if it was God that caused this. I think of a lot of denominational preachers. The Lord put this on my heart to tell you today. That kind of thing where God communicated to me and told me to tell you this. Or God did this to me on my way to work. Or God did this or that when really we don't know. I think of the providential perhaps in the book of Philemon, I know we've discussed this briefly before, with the uh, slave separated from his uh, uh, master, and, and Paul kind of words it that maybe he was uh, separated from you for some reason. You know, even Paul doesn't nail it down as in God did this. 
Um, even though it was a slave who ran away, even Paul was very careful not to attribute something to God that he really couldn't nail down on his own. So just a word of caution there. Let's not do what uh, Jacob does here. Uh, although for him at this point, it wasn't speculation. This was just outright lying. Um, so Isaac is still suspicious. So notice in verse 21, he demands to feel his son. <laughs> well, that right there is kind of strange also. You know, let me feel you. And he so he wants to investigate that something is still not right. And so he does. And and he feels the hair on his son's hands. And, and, and now something is really weird. This is really off. This guy I'm talking to, he's got the hands of Esau, but the voice of Jacob. He doesn't recognize him, but due to the hands, Esau starts blessing Jacob, thinking that he is Esau. So he, he, he's kind of making the decision here. He's heading down this path. Um, so let's continue then with the next paragraph, just kind of moving right into it. Genesis 27, verses 24 through 29. Genesis 27, 24 through 29. And he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. So he said, Bring it to me, and I will eat of my son's game, that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate. He also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him, and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you of the dew of heaven, and of the fatness of the earth, and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you, and nations bow down to you, be master of your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who cursed you. And blessed be those who bless you. Well, I know that last paragraph ended by saying that Isaac blessed his son, but it seems like he has even more doubts. Like right at the last moment, the, like the blessing is coming out of his mouth and, and he just can't do it. So he questions Jacob again. He wants to eat first, kind of I think as, as one more test, giving himself some more time to think through this. He eats, he drinks wine, uh, but even this isn't enough. So now he wants a kiss. And he uses this kiss as an excuse to take a whiff. He wants to, he wants to smell his son. So it seems his vision is failing. And so it seems to be the smell that finally allows him to give this blessing. Jacob smells like a field, just as Esau would have smelled. So this is what does it. And so Isaac continues on and gives the blessing here. He wishes... He wills. It's almost like he dictates. It's almost like this is what will happen. And because he's saying it, it will happen. So you see what I mean? It's not really just uh, a blessing. It, it's almost, and it's more than a prophecy. Kind of a strange thing going on here. But his wish or his will is that his son would always have an abundance. That he would be served by others. That everybody would bow down to him, including his brothers. That he would be uh, master over his brothers and that his mother's sons would bow down to him. Isn't that kind of a strange thing? Like, this is what I want to happen. Can you imagine saying that in your own family? I want my son number one to rule over son number two. That, it's just not really normal. And uh, I mean, this is not a normal family. And uh, to top all of this off, Isaac wills that anybody who curses his son would be cursed. Anyone who blesses him would be blessed. So it's pretty comprehensive and uh, kind of hard to wiggle out of this one as we're about to see. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 27 verses 30 through 38. Genesis 27 verses 30 through 38. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate of all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me even so or also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? 
for he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. So Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So this is where it all falls apart. As soon as Jacob gets the blessing and leaves, Esau walks in with some freshly cooked game looking for his blessing. Isaac realizes what has happened. He trembles violently. He weeps bitterly. And we also have this comment about uh, the name Jacob in verse 36, where Jacob basically means um, heel grabber or supplanter, one who takes the place of another. And so he's lived up to his name. He has succeeded in grabbing something. Um, just as he was holding on to Esau's heel when they were born. Well, Esau wants at least some kind of blessing, but there's apparently not much left. And again, how strange uh, to leave out your other son. Um, You know, even if he had this correct, it's just kind of mean to do it this way. Uh, You know, Isaac has already made Esau to be Jacob's servant. He's blessed him with abundant grain, new wine, uh, servants, and, and so what's left? Well, Esau at least wants something. It doesn't look good, and so he weeps. And uh, that brings us to Esau's blessing. So let's continue tonight then with Genesis chapter 27, verses 39 through 45. Genesis 27, 39 through 45. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now in the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise, arise, flee to Haran to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you did to him. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? As I said earlier, I don't completely understand this concept of blessing a child back then. Again, this is all kind of foreign to me. I mean, literally, different culture, different time. Uh, to me, I, th- I think you could say something like, well, now I bless you twice as much. <laughs> I, mean, I think I would go for a technicality like that of, of some kind. And so uh, that's apparently not the way that this works. So Isaac says that Esau's blessing is that he will be away from the fertility of the earth, that he would live by the sword, he'd be a servant to his brother. But the bit of hope for Esau here is that a time will come when he would break free from the yoke of his brother. At least this is something. Uh, But Esau is obviously not happy at all about this, to say the least. In verse 41, he makes the decision that as soon as his father dies, as soon as he is done mourning, that he will kill his brother Jacob. I mean, that's not really in keeping with the blessing, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, but Esau seems to be moving up the timeline uh, almost immediately. Uh, Rebecca hears about this, and um, and the warning gets to Jacob, sending him off to her brother Laban or Laban. And her plan at this time is for Jacob maybe to stay there a few days until Esau cools off a little bit, until this blows over, and then he can come back home in a week or two. Uh, But obviously her fear is that she loses both of her sons on the same day. Well, let's conclude tonight with Genesis 27, 46. One verse here at the end, Genesis 27, 46. Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Well, this is tacked on here at the end. It's actually really more of an introduction to Genesis 28 than it is a conclusion to chapter 27. But Rebecca seems to be pretty concerned with some of the local women. And she's worried that Jacob might marry one of these women and cause her uh, some grief in her life, even more than she's had up to this point. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 27. In terms of practical application, it seems we have a word of caution. 
uh, against showing partiality within the family. That seems to be a very practical lesson we can take away here, especially when it comes to favoring one child over another. Very rarely will that ever work out positively. Um, and by the way, as we wrap it up tonight, I also want to pass along an interesting story from back in 2016. And it was actually in November of 2016. So I think, you know, put that in, in your mind. November 2016, we were kind of thinking election, weren't we? <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. So we might have missed this story. Um, if you know any twins as these two young men were in this story tonight. But if you know any twins, then you might know that they are very much aware of who was born first, aren't they? At least I had two good friends growing up who were twins, just lived down the street from me there in Crystal Lake, and we would walk to school together. And man, they, they knew who was born first. Um, the firstborn often has some serious bragging rights. Oh yeah, I was I was born first. <laughs> you know, it was five minutes or an hour or whatever, but yeah, I was born first. Well, back in November of 2016, Emily Peterson gave birth to her first twin at 1.39 a.m. 1.39 a.m. right before the clocks turned back for daylight saving time. 31 minutes later, Emily gave birth to Ronan. However, because Ronan's birth came after the time change, his official time of birth was actually 1.10 a.m., meaning that he was legally born before his older brother. That right there hurts my brain, but uh, I thought that you should know this. I think especially as we have studied Jacob getting the blessing intended for the firstborn, uh, even though he was the second to be born. So next week, we hope to come back and look at uh, chapter 28. We'll take a look at Jacob fleeing toward Haran as he tries to hide from his brother's wrath. And uh, with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. We're still very early on in our study of Ephesians, so this would be a great time to jump in on that. And um, so we've got 930 for class, 1030 for worship. And then uh, that'll be our, our day for uh, Sunday, and then we'll come back together at the, at the bowling alley, I think about noon or right after worship, and head down there and uh, be able to uh, have some good Christian fellowship together. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for telling us about your servant Isaac and his family. And thank you for the warnings in Scripture. We're thankful that you've warned us about the deceitfulness of sin. We pray that we would not ignore those warnings, but that we would pay attention and that we would turn away from temptation, especially that we would turn away from the, tip, from the temptation to manipulate and deceive, as we've seen several times in this chapter tonight. Tonight we pray for parents who are raising young children, but we also pray tonight for parents whose children are grown as they continue to consider how to pass along their faith from one generation to the next. Uh, be with all of us, Father. Help us to uh, share our faith in effective ways and uh, bless our time together. In Jesus we pray. Amen.